works day by day. The charity of Christ urges us on. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Christ's love will show us the way. Send forth your light, send forth your truth, and let them be our guide. Until we find the path of peace, where justice will abide. The charity of Christ urges us on. Charity of Christ urges us on. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Christ's love will show us the way. Through dance and sing and shout for joy, let heaven and earth proclaim the kingdom and the power and the glory of God's name. The charity of Christ urges us on. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Christ's love will show us the way. Good morning. The St. Regis Parish Faith Community gathers for the liturgical celebration of the 28th Sunday in Ordinary Time. We ask you to fully participate in the liturgy as a community by praying and singing together. The second collection is for the Monthly Religious Education Fund. There are three announcements. The Knights of Columbus are sponsoring a membership social in Gillen Hall immediately after Mass today. Please stop in Gillen Hall after Mass, along with your family, for coffee and donuts and to learn more about the many activities of the Knights of Columbus. If you have not already signed up for a two-hour shift at the Oktoberfest, we are still in need of people to help with the catered food, children's games, bake sale, and set up the day before the Oktoberfest. Can you help for just two hours? Please call the parish office and put your name on the list. Also, look in the bulletin to see all the wonderful activities being offered at the Oktoberfest next weekend, including the fun of bobbing for apples. We also need all our great cooks to, cre to create their special dessert masterpieces for our famous bake sale. Remember, Oktoberfest next Sunday from 2 to 6. Also next Sunday, after the Masses, our Oktoberfest theme baskets will be available for you to look at and buy tickets for. Boxes will be ready for you to deposit your tickets for your favorite basket. That's next weekend after Masses for the Oktoberfest theme basket ticket sale. Good morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Bruno Mediate. I'm the current Grand Knight for the St. Regis Knights of Columbus. I'd like to take a few moments this morning, the eve of Columbus Day, to share with you some information about the Knights. In 1882, in the basement of St. Mary's Parish in New Haven, Connecticut, Father Michael J. McGivney and a small group of men from the parish established the Knights of Columbus. Father McGivney now the venerable Father McGivney, soon to be the first American Catholic priest to become a saint, saw that both Catholics and the church faced several problems in the last half of the 19th century. Problems such as anti-Catholicism, ethnic prejudice, underemployment, lack of social standing, and early loss of the family breadwinner. These are problems we still face today in the 21st century. Father McGivney conceived that the idea that an organization of Catholic men would band together to aid one another in times of sickness or death by means of a simple insurance plan to strengthen each other in their faith, strengthen families and family life,
be a strong pillar of support for priests and bishops, and be of service to the church and community by coming to the aid of those most in need in society. They called themselves knights, knights to emphasize the ideals of charity and support for the church and state. And Columbus, as a reminder, that Catholics had been the backbone of America's growth and greatness from the very beginning. Columbus himself was a devout Catholic, commissioned to spread Christianity throughout the New World. Our order is based on four principles. The first principle is charity. As St. James reminds us, faith without works is dead. Therefore, as knights we are committed to charity, easing the plight of the less fortunate. Unity is the second principle of the Knights of Columbus. In unity there is strength. Today the order uses that strength to speak out for religiously grounded moral values in a culture that has many times forsaken them. Fraternity is a third principle. Through the Knights of Columbus, men are able to band together as brothers to help one another in times of distress, sickness, and death. And patriotism is a fourth principle. Catholics are very proud citizens of their country. The values of devotion to God and country are the bedrock of patriotism. In 2014, our St. Regis Council celebrates its 43rd anniversary. Since 1971, we have remained a very visible presence. Our original charter is on display in Gillen Hall. You will see many familiar names on it. Several, unfortunately, are no longer with us. I'm sure you have seen us at many parish events wearing our blue polo shirts. You may have attended our bingos in Gillen Hall or pancake breakfast in Seton Place. You may have stood with us for an hour in front of the Family Planning Clinic in Pittsburgh during 40 Days for Life as we strive to preserve the sanctity of life from, con from conception through natural death. We actually have brother knights and parishioners there as we speak. You may have attended a special Olympic event with us. Nothing is more rewarding than spending time with these special athletes where it's not all about winning. I can tell you we learn a great deal from them and come away with such a wonderful feeling. Next week, you will see us rain or shine, making funnel cakes and running the beer stand at the Parish Oktoberfest. We did it last year and had a blast. For some reason, I didn't have any problems getting volunteers to run the beer stand. <laughs> we work hand in hand with the pastoral council, finance council, and stewardship committee. Much of the money we raise assists the temporal needs of the parish, especially when some unexpected emergency exists. Some of our other activities include the rose and certificate presentation at baptisms, support and collection for ARC to help individuals challenged with special needs, the altar server awards, the annual basketball free throw contest, a plaque wafer sale and keep Christ in Christmas campaign, the scholarship program, support for vocations, donation and support to Killian Heights, the Holy Thursday pilgrimage, pro-life activities including the baby bottle campaign which begins next month and the 40 days for life, and also voter registration. If you are a male, at least 18 years old, who lives up to the commandments of God and the precepts of the church, please consider becoming a brother knight. We invite you and your families to a social immediately after Mass in Gillen Hall. Please stop by for a cup of coffee, a glass of juice, a donut, or some cookies. We will have a slideshow, displays, pamphlets, and a number of brother knights on hand to answer any questions you may have. Our council has decided to waive and pay for the membership fees for all new members in 2014. If you are looking to live out your faith in the spirit of charity, unity, fraternity, and patriotism, which are the principles of our order, the Knights of Columbus welcomes you and are asking you to join us. Thank you for your time and God bless you. Please join in singing our opening hymn, number 930, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven, number 930. <laughs> Thank you. 
Good morning, everyone. This morning I welcome all of you for the celebration of the Mass and the mystery of the Eucharist. So my brothers and sisters, let us admit our sinfulness as we prepare then to celebrate this Eucharist. Lord Jesus, you call all of us who are sorry and contrite, Lord have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You forgive us sinners, Christ have, mercy. Christ have mercy. And here in our Eucharist this morning, you will nourish us, feed us, refresh us. Lord have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God now have mercy on us all, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace the people of goodwill. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you. We give you thanks for your great glory. Lord God, heavenly King, O God Almighty Father, Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, Receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Have mercy on us. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, and the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, may your grace, we pray, at all times go before us and follow after us, and make us always determined to carry out good works. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God now forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts, will provide for all peoples a feast of rich food and choice wines juicy rich food and pure choice wines on this mountain he will destroy the veil that veils all peoples the web that is woven over all nations he will destroy death forever the Lord God will wipe away the tears from every face the reproach of his people he will remove from the whole earth. For the Lord has spoken. On that day it will be said, Behold our God, to whom we look to save us. This is the Lord for whom we looked. Let us rejoice and be glad that he has saved us. For the hand of the Lord will rest on this mountain. The word of the Lord.
from the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. Brothers and sisters, I know how to live in humble circumstances. I know also how to live with abundance. In every circumstance and in all things, I have learned the secret of being well fed and of going hungry, of living in abundance and of being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Still, it was kind of you to share in my distress. My God will fully supply whatever you need in accord with his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father, glory forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. At that time, Jesus again in reply spoke to the chief priests and the elders of the people, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be likened to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. He dispatched his servants to summon the invited guests to the feast, but they refused to come. A second time he sent other servants, saying, Tell those invited, Behold, I have prepared my banquet. My calves and my fattened cattle are killed, and everything is ready, so come to the feast. But some ignored the invitation and went away, one to his farm, another to his business. The rest even laid hold of his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. Now the king, he was enraged. And he sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The feast is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy to come. Go out, therefore, into the main roads, and invite to the feast whomever you find. And so the servants went out into the streets, and they gathered all that they found, the good and the bad. And the hall was filled with guests. 
Now when the king came in, he greeted and met all the gifts. But he saw a man there not dressed in a wedding garment. And the king said to him, My friend, how is it that you enter in here without a wedding garment? But the man, he was reduced to silence. And so the king said to his attendants, Bind this man, his hands and his feet, and cast him out into the darkness outside, where there will be wailing and grinding of teeth. Because I tell you, many are invited, but only few are chosen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning again, everyone. Just a little introduction. My name is Father Pleban, and uh, I'm a retired priest now, have chalice, will travel, so to speak. And I'm related to Father David. His, uh, his mother, who died recently, was my first cousin. So this is all in the family this morning, in a way, and I'm uh, happy and very privileged to uh, help Father David this morning. The other thing that uh, I would simply say to you, and you have to be... Uh, very old to remember this, but I lived in this parish for one year here in the rectory, and this was back in 1964. And in 1964, Father Tom Gillen was the pastor here, and Father Anthony Wozniak uh, was the assistant. I was only here one year. The bishop had just appointed me to take care of our Catholic accent. And before I got my feet wet, he wanted me to go to Duquesne for one year and do some journalistic work and uh, public relations in television and radio and things like that. So I came here, and uh, Father Wojniak was here in 1962, he told me, to 1968. And he, by the way, uh, he, we were living together at the retirement home in, uh, in uh, Greensburg. He and Father Donahue both told me that when I was coming here, he says, tell those people we said hello, and they certainly are in our prayers. But I came here. Uh, just trying to make this a long story short, but I came here with a little trepidation because I heard about Father Tom Gillen. He was, uh, he was, he was a, a good priest, a very good priest. When you people, you people are new to the parish, when you look at this beautiful parish plant, everything you have here, this church, the parking lot, this, the school upstairs and the rooms and the rectory, Father Gillen was responsible for all of that. He, he was the man. I know a lot of other people did a lot of things here, like Father Ackerman, Father Nico, Father Donahue, uh, those people, but Father Gillen was the man. But when I came here, I had heard about him. I heard that when he was a young priest uh, in Pittsburgh, he was on a streetcar and some, uh, some guys start making fun of the Catholic Church and this priest, and Father Gillen knocked him out. And the, uh, the Bishop of Pittsburgh, being a good bishop, he had to suspend Father Gillen for one year. So he did, yeah, he's probably glad he knocked the fellow out, but <laughs> nevertheless, uh, he uh, suspended Father Gillen for one year and then he came here and built all what you have here. But uh, I heard stories about him. Once I got here, I heard beautiful stories about him. Uh, I came through this morning level green. Back in 1964, that was just a development plan. And Father Gillen would go out there to every home and knock on the door and talk about evangelization today. He did that. He picked a few homes and would teach catechism to the children at night. So this is the kind of man that was here. But in the meantime, uh, this morning you have a retired priest. I was an active priest until uh, 2010, but then when I was 80, I retired. So that's already four years ago. And I live with Father Wozniak and Father Donahue up in the retirement home in Greensburg. So it's my privilege and honor to be back here at St. Regis. And I congratulate you for uh, this parish and what you've done here in, in Trafford. The gospel this morning is a story about a king inviting wedding guests. And I guess the most important thing about the whole story is the very ending where he sees a man come in and he doesn't have a wedding garment on and it seems strange that he becomes mean and angry and he casts the man out. But what we have to remember is that in the days of Christ, when if you were a rich person uh, and you had a wedding feast for maybe your son or daughter, out in the foyer, out in the hall, you provided a wedding garment. It was almost like the white alb that a priest wears. But you were supposed to take that garment and put it over your 
your clothes as you came into the wedding feast. Now this man, he accepts the king's invitation, but he accepts it on his terms. And I guess the thing that we are supposed to take out of the parable and the lesson this morning is that we, we are all invited. We are all invited by God, certainly to this banquet, to the banquet in heaven one day. But we don't accept it on our terms, we accept it on God's terms. And so we have to have on, you know, the right garment, the right garment. Fifty years ago, you know, you could tell where people were going by the way they were dressed. The way they were dressed, you knew they were going to church or they were going to cut grass. Today we live in a very casual dress generation. Uh, you can't tell where people are going by the way they are dressed. Uh, that we wear the same clothes to go to church, we wear the same clothes to cut grass, to go to Walmart, to go to a wedding. And don't panic, I'm not going to preach a homily about the way we're dressed here this morning. But the symbolism of it is important. We have to be dressed properly. And this morning as we talk about it, we're talking about something spiritual. Are we coming this morning invited to this Eucharistic feast? And one day, hopefully, to that banquet in heaven, are we spiritually dressed properly? What does that mean? That means, I guess, we should be here, free from any you know, serious sin or fault or failing. It means we should be here with the, the garment of love, God's love on us. And the, there's another parable, and I'm sure you're familiar with it, about the end of the world. Remember that judgment day that Christ talks about in scriptures? And he says that at the end of the world, God is going to be that judge. And there's going to be two groups of people. One on this side, one on, this, on the other side. And God will say to them, uh, come you now. Come you now into the kingdom prepared for you uh, by my Father in heaven. And these people, of course, will ascend into heaven. And they're all surprised. And he says... When I was hungry, when I was thirsty, when I was naked, you, you did something for me. And they say to him, uh, Lord, when did we ever do that? And he says, anytime you did it for anyone, you did it for me. And then he says to the other people, uh, you cursed, go into the, rain, the kingdom of hell. And they say the same thing. Uh, Lord, when did we see you naked and not do anything? When did we see you hungry and not do anything? And he says the same thing to them. When you did it to anyone, you did it to me. And so today as we come here and we talk about this, this particular parable, we, we, we examine our conscience a little. You know, the people we're sitting next to, even though you're sitting next to your family, uh, they really don't know who and what you are. They think they do, but only you do. Only you know who and what you are. And that's the reason when we read a parable like this, we have to put it on our own shoulders and say, who am I? I'm coming here now to this, this banquet, this Eucharist. Am I clothed with the garment of God? And that's an important question to ask ourselves this morning. Are we the person that we seem to be? There's a, there's a little story, it's a, a parable that I'd like to conclude with this morning. And uh, it has a lesson in itself. So just listen to this briefly. There was a man once who when the light turned yellow, the, the parable is titled, The Light Turned Yellow. There was a man once who when the light turned yellow just in front of him, he did the right thing, stopping, stopping at the crosswalk even though he could have beaten the red light by accelerating through the intercession. In the meantime, the tailgating woman was furious, and she honked her horn, screaming in frustration. As she missed her chance to get through the intersection, dropping her cell phone, dropping her makeup, as she was still cussing him out in a mid-rant, she heard a tap on her window and looked up into the face of a very serious, young-looking police officer. The officer ordered her to exit the car with her hands up. He took her to the police station where she was searched, fingerprinted, 
photographed and placed in a holding cell. After a couple of hours, a policeman approached the cell and opened the door. She was escorted back to the booking place where the arresting officer was awaiting with all of her personal uh, effects. He said to her, you know, I'm very, very sorry for this mistake. He says, you see, I pulled up behind your car while you were giving the man your finger and blowing your horn and cussing him. And I noticed the, the bumper sticker on your car. On the left, there was a bumper sticker, what would Jesus do? On the right, there was a bumper sticker, choose life. Then your plate holder said, follow me to Sunday school. And the chrome-plated Christian fish symbol then was on your trunk. So then I just assume you had stolen the car. <laughs> you know, we laugh, and it, this is priceless, the story. And I'm sure you'll retell it in your own way, maybe. But uh, what it tells us is that sometimes... Uh, we come here and our hands are folded, we're praying the rosary, and uh, maybe sometimes this past week we also had road rage, so to speak. So it's important sometimes that when we come here we are clothed, we are clothed with that garment of good deeds, uh, that garment of service to others, that garment of God's love. St. Paul in one of the uh, scriptures says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And we all believe that. I certainly believe that. I preach that. But our church, our Catholic church, and other Christian churches too, they also say faith without good works is dead. And that's what we have to apply to ourselves this morning. Let us all stand now and recite the creed of our faith. Of all things visible and invisible, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Who him all things were made, for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Believing that God does hear and answer all of our prayers, let us make our petitions and prayers now to our Father in heaven. The response is, Lord, hear our prayer. That one day, all Christians will be united at the Lord's table. Let us pray. Lord, hear our prayer. That all nations will work together so that the least among us may find life's necessities in abundance. Let us pray. Lord, hear our prayer. That all those confined to their homes, long-term care facilities and nursing homes, will find strength in their faith in Christ the Healer. Let us pray. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. That God's grace might strengthen us to carry out the good <sighs> works that build up his kingdom. Let us pray. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. That the weakest and most vulnerable, the sick, the old, the unborn, and the poor, masterpieces of God's creation, made in God's own image, may be assured of our protection. Let us pray. Lord, hear our prayer. 
for the intentions of this Mass, for Paul Scholar, for Helen Belmondo, and for the people of the parish, let us pray. Lord, Lord hear Lord, our Lord. prayer. That those who have died might rejoice and be glad at the Lord's eternal banquet, let us pray. Lord, Lord hear, hear our Lord. prayer. For the prayers we hold deep in our hearts, which we now pause to add. I know a lot of you would want me to pray for the Steelers today, but let us pray instead for Father David, who was on retreat last week. May Father David come back refreshed and Christ-like. Let us pray. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, give to all of us just the grace, the strength that we help, not just for today. We ask and pray for this through Christ our Lord. 